Hi and welcome, today's video comes from the UK, and tells the story of Mad Billy and Pottery Cottage. The events told, unfolded in Chesterfield during its worst snowstorm in 20 years. If you like the video, please hit the thumbs up as it will help my channel grow. William Thomas Hughes, was born on August 8, 1946, in Preston, Lancashire. He was the first of six children, born to Thomas Hughes and his wife, Mary. Throughout school, his academic performance was poor, and he had little interest in his education, he seemed more prone to antisocial behavior and petty criminality from a young age. From leaving school at 15, William failed to hold down any long-term jobs, and as a result of his criminal behavior, he ended up having spells at Borstal, which is another name for juvenile detention centers. He continued his life of crime, and out of the 21 court appearances he made, he received his first of many prison sentences in 1966. William was released from prison in 1972, upon his release he met a girl called Jean, his soon-to-be wife, he proposed to her when she visited him when he was imprisoned again, that's very romantic. Jean stated, the first two years weren't too bad, but after that, he became violent, especially when he was drunk. In March, 1976, after only three years of marriage, he left his wife and moved to Chesterfield to live with his girlfriend. William would always fight with the police, on one occasion, police found drugs in the back of his car, and he went on to resist arrest, which resulted in two officers needing hospital treatment. He was then taken to the police station, where he headbutted another officer, then smashed up the cell. The police called him Mad Billy. He was sentenced to three years in jail for a string of violent offenses, and upon completing that sentence, he was a free man for only a few months, when he was once again arrested, this time, it was more serious. On the night of August the 21st, 1976, he followed a couple out of a nightclub into a park, where he watched the couple become intimate. He crept up on them, and smashed a brick into the man's head, rendering him unconscious. He then dragged the woman to a river bank, where she was sexually assaulted in the worst possible way. He then fled the scene. The distraught woman rushed to her boyfriend's aid, then eventually raised the alarm. Police arrived but William was long gone. Following a public appeal, the police were tipped off, and William was duly arrested, charged, and remanded to Leicester Prison. Despite his history of violent behavior, William was allocated work in the prison kitchen, from where, on December 3, 1976, he stole a knife which he managed to keep concealed, despite subsequent searches by prison guards. On Wednesday 12 January, 1977, Leicester was having its worst snowstorm in 20 years, and William Hughes was being taken from Leicester Prison, to Chesterfield Magistrates Court escorted by two prison officers in a taxi. Little did they know, that Hughes had the knife that he stole some weeks earlier, concealed in his clothing. Along the way, William asks to use the toilet at Trowel Service Station. When they pull up, he stabs both prison guards in the neck, then handcuffs the pair together in the back of the taxi, along with the driver. They drive off into the snowstorm, where the taxi driver and the prison officers are dumped a few miles down the road. Both prison officers were badly injured, but would go on to make a full recovery. William carries on alone, and in his haste to get away, crashes the taxi about a mile down the road. He heads north across Bealey Moor. He jogs for around three hours in freezing snow, until he comes to a house called Pottery Cottage. Pottery Cottage is an 18th century pottery workshop, converted into three dwellings, the Moran family live at one end, and two teachers, the Newmans, live at the other. The middle property is empty. There were five people living in the Moran family home. Arthur Minton, who was a 72-year-old retired greengrocer, his 68-year-old wife Amy. They lived with their daughter Gillian and her husband Richard, along with their 10-year-old granddaughter, Sarah. When Gillian's mother, Amy Minton, heard the handle turn on the back door that snowy winter's day, she was expecting to see her daughter returning from work. Instead, she came face to face with escaped prisoner William Hughes, dripping wet from the snowstorm, 
and carrying two axes he'd stolen from the yard. William came into the house and locked the door behind him. He informed Amy that he was on the run from the police, and that he wouldn't hurt anyone, as long as she does what she's told. But just seconds later, when Amy's 72-year-old husband Arthur entered the kitchen, he was savagely struck across the head by William and knocked to the floor. William asked who else lived in the house, then took a kitchen knife from the drawer and waited for the rest of the family to arrive. Gillian, who worked as a secretary in nearby Chesterfield, arrived home from work a short time later. Her mother lets her in, telling her there's a man here on the run from the police, he's got a knife but he's promised not to harm us. About 3.30 p.m., the school bus drops Gillian's daughter Sarah off. Gillian tells her that William's car has broken down and he's waiting for a tow truck, then tells her to go and play in her room. When husband Richard arrived home around 5 p.m., he found his wife with a knife at her throat. Don't come near me, or I'll kill her, William told him. The whole family are tied up and taken to separate bedrooms, Arthur is the only one kept downstairs. Sarah was heard to say to William, don't you hurt my mummy and daddy, don't you dare. That night, Gillian heard cries and moans coming from downstairs, and knew it was her father being savagely beaten, the cries grew fainter until they went completely silent. Later that night, William came up to Gillian's bedroom, he stripped her, and forced her to perform a sex act on him, while he savagely bit her shoulder. She was only saved from further assault, because she was on her monthly period. Richard, bound and gagged in the room next door, could only listen as she was being abused. The next morning, a van pulled up outside, the septic tank was due to be emptied. William instructs Gillian to appear as normal, she follows his instructions, thinking it's the only way to keep her family safe, and says nothing. When she comes back into the house, she sees her father with a coat covering his head, William convinces her that he is asleep. Gillian is then instructed to ring her work and Sarah's school and tell them that they are sick and won't be attending. Then, she is told to go to the shops to get cigarettes and a newspaper. Again, she complies for the sake of her family. William unties the family, except for Arthur, and bizarrely he plays cards with them and lets them read the newspapers, he even takes Richard and Gillian out in Richard's car as he wanted to test drive it. He planned on using Richard's car to go and see a friend who he'd committed a robbery with and collect his half of the proceeds. He ties the family up again and takes Gillian with him, warning the family not to try to escape. They set off to the friend's house and upon arrival, William takes the keys out of the ignition and goes in alone then reappears a few minutes later, telling Gillian that he was disturbed by a policeman, and to Gillian's dismay, he instructs her to drive back to the cottage. They arrive back in the early hours of Friday the 14th of January, and William immediately instructs Amy, Richard and Gillian to sleep in the same room as him, so he can keep an eye on them. The next morning, William tells Gillian and Richard to go to the shops for supplies, he gives her £25 which he had stolen out of the house, and they head off. Richard pleads with Gillian for them to inform the police, but Gillian is too worried about her family, and insists that if they follow his demands, they will be released unharmed. The pair buy all the supplies that William wanted, and filled the car with petrol, also buying a newspaper which had William's photo on the front page. They then returned back to the cottage. William told Richard that he needed money to help with his escape, and asked Richard if there was any cash at the office where he worked. Richard told him that there was a safe there. At 6pm on that Friday evening, William, Richard and Gillian, set off to Richard's work at Brett Plastics in Chesterfield. When they arrived, the night shift had started, and Richard went in alone. He tells a colleague that he is working late, then lets William and Gillian into the office. His work colleagues don't suspect a thing as Richard was a trustworthy employee. William searches through the safe and finds a cash box with around £210 in it, before leaving and heading for the car. They then head back to Pottery Cottage. Police at this point were still searching for William, although the heavy snowfall and blizzard conditions had hampered the search, 
two army helicopters deployed to assist, were soon grounded. The search for William remained focused on the area between the crashed vehicle and the A6 road. House-to-house -house checks were conducted in villages within the search radius, such as Beely and Rosely. Pottery Cottage was a mere 600 feet north of the search radius, meaning the property wouldn't be checked. When the three arrive back at the cottage, William ties up Richard, then fills the car with all the supplies that were bought earlier that day, he then puts Gillian in the car, and drives away leaving the rest of the family tied up. Along the route, William tells Gillian that he has forgotten a roadmap, and needs to return to the cottage to get it. They return to the cottage, and William tells Gillian to wait inside the car whilst he goes for the roadmap. Although his intentions are a lot more sinister. He takes several minutes in the house, and Gillian becomes increasingly worried. When he returns, the car won't start, so he asks Gillian to go around to the Newmans, who lived in the end house, and ask for help starting the car. The Newmans had not heard about an escaped prisoner in the area, but Gillian managed to whisper to her neighbor what was happening. Mr. Newman, who didn't have a telephone, started his car and sped off to inform the police. Upon seeing this, William tries again to start the car, with no luck. It is at this point when Amy staggers from the house with her throat cut, she collapses, dying, right in front of her screaming daughter. After seeing her mother stagger from the house into the snow, blood pouring from a deep wound in her neck, Gillian turned and ran, only to bump into William coming the other way. He dragged her to the road and made her hide in a ditch out of sight of cars, until they reached another neighbor's house, which belonged to mechanic Ron Frost and his wife, Madge. They ask Ron to help them start the car. Gillian discreetly manages to tell Madge what is happening, before going with William and the unsuspecting Ron, to fix the car. Madge calls the police, and by the time she calls them, the Newmans have already arrived at the police station and help was on the way. Ron managed to get the car started, and immediately William took Gillian hostage, and sped off. Police arrived at the cottage, minutes later, and found four dead bodies. Arthur, his wife Amy, Richard, and his young daughter Sarah. All four had died as a result of multiple stab wounds to the throat and chest, despite Hughes maintaining the pretense that Arthur and Sarah were still alive throughout. Both are thought to have been murdered on the first night. Police were soon in pursuit of the killer and his hostage. They soon caught up with him, and began a high-speed multiple car chase across Derbyshire, ending when he swerved to miss an oncoming bus, and crashed into a wall in the village of Reno. His car was quickly surrounded by police, with Detective Chief Inspector Peter Rouse leading the hostage negotiations. William held an axe over Gillian's head, and demanded a vehicle in which to escape. As firearms officers moved into place, a getaway vehicle was provided, but Gillian refused to move, she had taken as much as she could from William and was going no further. This infuriated William, who went to strike Gillian with the axe, but one of the police officers jumped into the car and shielded her from getting harmed. It was at this point that firearms officers open-fired on William. The first shot hit William in the back of the head, but the bullet didn't enter his skull, it just seemed to bounce off, which made him even more psychotic as he continued to fight. He was shot four times before he was finally killed, apart from a graze on her forehead, Gillian was physically unharmed. His three days of terror had ended, but Gillian's nightmare was only beginning, as she was unaware that her whole family was dead. In just three days, she had lost her mother, father, husband and daughter. Gillian was distraught. Although, they say time is a great healer, and in this case, it was true. Gillian managed to get her life back together, and two years later, married Jim Mulqueen, who was a cousin of her husband. They went on to have a daughter in 1980, and named her Jane Sarah, in memory of her half-sister she would never know. However, the happiness would not last, as her new husband turned to alcohol, maybe through the stress and anguish of everything. Nine years into the marriage, he was jailed for two years for threatening a pub owner with a shotgun. William Hughes's evil legacy extended beyond the grave, when his former wife Jean, tortured by the memories of what he had done, 
sadly took her own life. And his daughter Nicola, had to move area, just to get away from her father's past. She no longer wanted to be known as Mad Billy's daughter. Gillian is still alive and kicking, and is the ripe old age of 83. It takes a strong woman to come through life after going through all of that pain. Thanks for watching, please give the video a thumbs up, it helps to get the video seen and also consider subscribing if you like true crime videos, as we post videos on a weekly basis.